resume that. If you didn't get that, it <laughs> told you. Yep, and I see it. Yeah. I'm I'm trying a new app that will actually um provide a transcript, meeting summary, and that kind of stuff. Um so um I'm gonna go ahead and launch that and uh I've never used this before, so it'll be interesting to see how it works out, okay? Okay. And it actually is going to join us. You see it as a as a participant. Okay. So. All right. All right. That's interesting. Okay. So, um, blowback firearms. Um, you know, reading through the posts, uh, there was one post that was talking about plus P and plus P plus and how most blowbacks are not um, rated for that. Um, I actually uh, sent a message or replied to that post asking where that data came from, because if we think about a blowback firearm, right, a blowback firearm is really anything that's not pump, lever, single shot, break action, and then gas operated, <laughs> right? Okay. So, yeah. you know, a 1911 is a blowback firearm, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the talked about two different kinds of locking systems. As a general rule, a blowback operated firearm is locked up when the bolt face is all the way closed against the chamber, right? Yeah. Then you have your uh, roller delay and then delayed blowback. So thinking about a 1911, a 1911 is actually a delayed blowback because of the length system. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, uh, one of the challenges uh one of the challenges that does exist um and this is this is more with um <clears throat> this is more with your uh 22 caliber right 22 caliber the way it actually functions is a vacuum system right so um when the firing pin strikes the the rim primer ignites, powder burns, the case expands to stick against a chamber wall to create a gas seal. Yeah. Right. All that air in the barrel is pushed out by the projectile and the hot gas, right? So with all that air pushed out, what happens next is it sucks it back in, right? So vacuum, it's going to fill the void. So when it fills the void, um, the case at that point has um, constricted because it's not hot anymore. Well, it's hot, but it's not hot, hot, right? Constricts. Yeah. So it, it breaks that gas seal, that air rushing in hits that cartridge. And so the cartridge um, energy pushed back against the bolt plus that inrush of air, that vacuum sucks that case out okay okay now um when when you're looking at um you know with 22s the only reason you have an extractor hook is really to ensure that the case stays on the bolt face because okay. the, the extraction is done through the vacuum and the energy not the hook itself all right. Okay. It, so, I'm start, yeah, I'm starting to get more of the sense of like how, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, so explain back to me what I just explained to you, um, you know, kind of as a check on, on did it make sense? So that way I can address any questions you might have. Yeah. Cause how it, cause you said how does the vacuum seal for the 22 and how it actually like, it ex the case expands 
after it's been after the uh, powder has been powder burns, and then as the bullet actually is like disconnects from the case itself too, at what it probably maybe like halfway through like through the barrel you say like that air would rush back into the case. Not until the projectile actually leaves the muzzle, right? Ah, uh, okay. So, so you know, um, people talk about um, firing a gun underwater, right? Yeah. Part of the problem, I mean, it'll work, right? But part of the problem is water is denser than air. So that projectile has to push that water out of the barrel in, in order for it to leave, okay? Yeah. Um, which is why it doesn't work very well. So if you think if you think about you know that that twenty two uh, let's talk about um, the Mark three Ruger Mark three or the ten twenty two, right? Both of those are some automatic. So the projectile is pushing all of the air inside the barrel out, and then once it leaves and the gas leaves, we get the report, right? The bang, and then the air rushes back in to fill that emptiness that was created by the projectile and the hot gas traveling out the muzzle. Okay. So that, and that's how you would actually create the delay for it, for like a delay blowback. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that kind of, cause like I was trying to like figure that part out. So now I get it. Like, which is why they try to come up with different concepts of delay uh, blowback. Right. You know, and, and if you look at like your pistol caliber carbines, right, uh, the pistol, the nine millimeter in an AR or the 45 or 40 or whatever pistol caliber it happens to be, right? Um, you know, the, the challenge there and why a lot of people have issues with how they're running, meaning they, they, they won't feed reliably, they won't eject reliably, all that kind of stuff, is because they're using too heavy a buffer spring because that's operating exactly the same way. It's straight blowback, right? So the energy of the cartridge has to be enough to be able to accelerate the bolt backwards. So weight of the bolt against the weight of the spring. So if the spring's too heavy, cartridge doesn't have enough energy. It can't move the bolt fast enough for it to go far enough back to actually eject or if it does eject it doesn't go far enough back to pick up the next cartridge so with a with a straight blowback system the balance of bolt weight and recoil spring or whatever the spring is that it's using is absolutely crucial to whether or not it is successful okay yeah because now it it's like when you think of the physics of it too, when if the buffer spring is too strong. It's too much tension against the not bolt. enough tension. Yeah, it's too much and it's not enough for that for even to act to extract and eject the cartridge the casing out, which could even just halfway get jammed like in the process. Yes. Yeah. So like a stovepipe on your AR carbine. Yeah. Would most likely it's an issue in either cartridge energy or um, buffer spring tension or both. Okay. So what in the event if someone actually decided to change out, they changed out their buffer spring to a, a lighter one? Correct. And it's a little bit lighter than you know, it's a little bit easier to compress than, you know, usual ones. And then would it just be a bit more of a faster, like, uh, a faster, like, uh, cycle for firing? It wouldn't be a faster cycle of firing. Again, remember, we're talking about straight blowback, right? Yeah. So, so you know, the cartridge, the, when you, when you buy, when you buy a nine millimeter caliber upper for an AR, the bolt is a nine millimeter bolt, right? Okay. So that bolt is weighted to work with that cartridge. Okay. okay. So 
um, if they if you're not getting a reliable cycle, meaning it goes bang, bolt comes back, ejects, but doesn't come back far enough to pick up the next round and then comes forward again, that means the buffer spring is, is the poundage on the buffer spring is too much. So we lighten the buffer spring. Now the bolt, which is set for that nine millimeter, works the way it's supposed to because you don't have the extra spring tension preventing the cycle of operations from continuing. Okay. So okay. So in the fact of in the event of lightening that spring too, like from where like per se, like you, you know, you bought you bought yourself a straight blowback with the stock that stock spring and you want to change it out because you want to make it you want to make a lighter spring right okay. uh, the best thing to do would then be to go to like wolf gun springs and buy the lighter buffer spring i mean you can like cut coils and all that kind of stuff but you'd be better off just buying another spring um just for reliability yeah i mean like you can but the way that the end caps are for like how those springs are too it's you know it's not like it's not like your whatever mattress spring you're thinking of but no it's right. not like that right okay uh, yeah because i think there was something some person wanted to do that too and they they changed out their buffer spring to like a really light one too and because I guess they were trying to compensate for the cartridges they were using for their, they were trying to like replicate, replicate like a honey badger type uh, AR. Okay. Yeah, and so they were well, and, had to and, do like a 300 blackout with it too and changed out the buffer spring to like a lighter poundage. The, the other thing to pay attention to is buffer weight, right? Because remember with the AR platform, you have that, that metal weight that that the buffer spring sits over and yeah. so it may be a combination of those two okay right so it, it it's all a balancing act it's what it, what it boils down to okay all right yeah because that's other than that it just you'd be it, you just you really would mess up you to mess up your whole cycles for it um I like that. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, set up with, let's see, let me share screen. All right. Can you see okay? Yeah. Okay. Let me adjust this here. All right. So um, this is a Glock, obviously. <laughs> now, um, no magazine, nothing in the chamber. We good? Yeah. All right. So notice how the barrel tilts, right? Yeah. So um, another thing that's interesting to look at um notice so the bar the barrels excuse me uh the barrels tilted but if you look at the slide notice the slide actually sits on an angle yeah so part of the part of the recoil control in your glocks is the fact that this is actually recoiling at an angle up to help keep the muzzle down <clears throat> okay which is kind of cool. Now, again, this is a blowback operated firearm, right? Yeah. 
the locking point for this is right here. Okay. So that forward ledge of the of the chamber, right? Actually locks. So if you watch it as we unlock it, see how it drops? Yeah. So that's that's your delay, right? Um the energy has to overcome the recoil spring. And so when the projectile has left the barrel, again, same thing, case expands, right? Brass is sticky at temperature and then um, uh, creates that gas seal. Once the gas leaves, it shrinks. And then this moves backward, pulling that barrel into the locking block, right? Yeah. Which is what causes it to tilt up. Okay. Because I was gonna say, like, looks. Is, would you say it's more like a locking lug or a, like a locking? I, I would. So the back end of the the that that front end of that chamber would be a locking lug. So it has one locking lug, right? Okay. Um, and uh, the motion of the slide with the energy of the cartridge and the recoil spring is what causes it to drop into the locking block which stops the rearward motion of the of the barrel and then causes it to tilt um, so that it's positioned to pick up the next round. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah. All right. So this is a 1911 barrel. Now, 1911 does exactly the same thing, except it uses a link, which is here. Okay, and that's considered like the same thing as helping the barrel tilt. Yes, yes. So, nothing in the magazine. Yeah. Nothing in the magazine well. Yeah. And then nothing in the chamber. Yep. Okay. So the tilt is less noticeable on this. Ah, come on. Okay. Yeah, it's not it's not noticeable really. Yeah. It's yeah. But it's there. Now the way that works. It's always easier to take the spring tension off. <laughs> yeah. I'm off. There we go. All right. So you have your your link here, right? Yeah. Your tape down lever is also your slide stop, uh, slide lock. So um, when it goes bang, the force causes it to rotate back and down, which unlocks your locking lugs from the inside of the slide. Okay. Okay. So in the gun, Come on. So in the gun, with the with the slide forward and the barrel uh, and everything locked up, it's like this. Okay. Okay. When it goes bang and the slide starts to move, it pulls it. You see how it drops it down? Yeah. 
So it's still a tilt, but it, it's more of a straight back. Now, when you look here, see how your chamber surfaces line up? Yeah. So um, if you're in a, if you have a customer bringing a gun and hollow points aren't feeding well, one of the things you can do is you can come in and polish these surfaces so that they match. Okay. Because if if a hollow point's not feeding well, a lot of times it's because it's catching on that sharp edge at the bottom of the chamber. Okay. Is that right. kind of like is that kind of like a normal like for hollow points to actually kind of do that? Um, in 1911s, it's more common. Okay. Cause I have never fired hollow points. So I have no, cause I know that they sound different, but. Yeah. Well, it's, it's because of the open mouth, it doesn't have the same, uh, old give and, and melt plat, which, um, you will learn in your ballistics 100 class. Um, so, um, <clears throat> now when it goes, when it comes forward. So it slide comes forward, it picks up the cartridge, it slams it into that ram, uh, that ramp, that ramp then kicks it up into the chamber, at which point it's supposed to roll. And then it comes back forward. And when it comes forward, these locking lugs re-engage. Ah, okay. Okay. So um, with 1911s, that the space um, between the, the, the top of the chamber, which is here, right? The top of the chamber and the top of the slide, you actually measure and it's supposed to be three hundredths, just off the top of my head. Um, I, you know, I, I looked that stuff up. It's so much easier than trying to memorize it all. <laughs> um, but um if you have if you have too much engagement um your link is too long if you have too little engagement your link is too short and so the links are actually numbered one through five and so you're you're measuring and doing a bunch of math to determine well it had a link it had a number one link which link do i need to go to <laughs> okay <laughs> um to to figure that out okay makes sense yeah okay yeah it's more of a reason for me to actually get a 1911 because like i mean my older brother he has like uh two i believe so far you know, and he's, you know, he's excited about it. It's like, he tries to talk to me. I'm like, I'm like, if I, if I actually have it, I would have more of an understanding of what you're, what you're trying to explain to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, one of the things I like about the 1911 as a platform is, is that the, um, the frame is the same. So you can actually change calibers simply by, changing um changing the barrel in the slide so like if you wanted if you had a, a, a 45 um assuming your um uh, ejector would work with the the um, nine millimeter barrel you can actually um build a, a nine millimeter upper for it and um There we go. Come on. Um, which is just which is just kind of cool, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, I I've got uh, I've got one frame that I can shoot uh, ten different calibers off of. Remember how we're talking about balancing springs? Yeah. That becomes a real bugger because you're trying to balance the springs in here with the recoil spring and the caliber you're using. <laughs> wow. So. All right. Any questions on either of those two? 
Um, no, pretty much just like I mean, I should, I should, I want to restore one or at least find one that's incomplete. <laughs> um, you might consider looking at nineteen eleven builders. Um, they actually have uh eighty percent frames. And so, ah, okay. so with the right jig, um, you actually cut your rails. Okay. And it, it would be a great learning experience because you're you're custom fitting everything. So because you're because you're custom fitting the slide and the barrel and the hood and um you know your links and and all and and your springs all of that stuff you're doing all of that um it's a great learning learning experience yeah it's so far it's been cool for me like when actually buying i had to buy the uh i had to buy a stripped fcu for my uh, for my p320 yep because i wanted to build an m17 eventually but it's like I think I looked on the Glock store and they had one for like you know ninety nine dollars and but it had to be stripped so I was like okay yeah I uh, I actually picked up two of those off a of gun broker um, the other day because a buddy of mine gave me two P three twenty frames and uh, wants me to build one for him and said I can do whatever the heck I want with the second one. All right, so it's not quite as cool as a brown bag. I was looking for a brown bag, but here is the Zip 22 <laughs> in all of its pieces. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, uh, it's an interesting gun um, that unfortunately doesn't work very well. All right. Um, so polymer frame, you notice there's no grip. Uh, the idea is if you're a right-handed shooter, you're grabbing it here and then you bring your other hand in to create your, your grip, but it's all your hands that are doing it. It's not, act, you're not actually holding on to anything down here. Right. Uh, okay. I mean, I, well, yeah, for it being a 22, like anything, lar anything larger, I don't think you'd be able to like. I, I well, you probably could. It just wouldn't be very comfortable. It doesn't. It doesn't look comfortable, really. With, with no. Uh, amazingly enough, it feels pretty good. Really. Yeah. Um. So you know, here's your trigger. Here's your safety. Um. If you look in the top, there's actually your uh, trigger arrangement for your striker. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna set this to the side. I'm gonna move uh, right here. A little bit of space. I apologize for the clutter in my office. It's been a storage room for the last 14 months, so I'm trying to get everything back in order. No, it's no, it's okay. All right. This is your firing pin and ejector. Oh, where's wait what yes oh, wow so um recoil spring is uh right through here okay you have a guide rod that the bolt travels on that rides through there that's actually your firing pin you know it's going to strike your your rim and then yeah. Because it protrudes when it gets all the way back, it also acts as the ejector. Wow. Okay. So, like, oh, sorry. So, like, the angle of that firing pin ejector is a little bit of a. You no, know, it, it's just because it protrudes when it gets all the way back. You know, the case the case is going to be pushed off the bolt face by yeah. that, by that point. All right. Now, this is your bolt. So it's a polymer block. Okay. There is uh, your breech face. 
Okay. All right. What do you notice is missing? I don't see like there's no like where's the like where's the barrel in the chamber or like well that's all forward. Okay. So what do you see on most bolt faces? You see the firing pinhole, right, which is here. Yeah. And then you see uh, something else. Normally, on I mean, you would usually. I mean, where's the extractor for it? Like bingo. Remember, twenty twos operate on on vacuum. Oh yeah, that's right. It has no extractor hook. Oh, uh, okay. That so, is. So one of the challenges on on this gun is is that if the ammunition's not not strong enough, right? Um, oh come on! Oh come on! There we go. If the ammunition's not strong enough, right? Or yeah. the chamber's rough. You know, so the chamber's not polished. What happens is, is the case doesn't come out of the chamber because there's nothing to pull it out. That is, um, wow. Okay. Which is, which is why you got a lot of double feeds or failures to extract, failures to eject. It operates off of a Ruger 1022 magazine. So, you know, when it comes back, it, it it's trying to grab that next round, but because there was nothing to pull it out of the chamber to begin with. Uh, it, like in the event, like, I mean, most commonly, like, what do you think it just gets, it gets stuck because it can't actually. There's not enough, there's not enough energy or not enough um, intentional energy to cause everything to come back. Because you said it's polymer, so it like it's yes. So this is polymer. So it's super lightweight. Yeah, how does it work under pressure and heat? Oh, it's fine. Okay. Uh, you know, but the but the idea was is oh, so this block is light, so all of our recoil control is going to be from the recoil spring. Right. Okay. So, the, so, I mean, this is this is true straight blowback in that there is nothing that locks it in, not locks it in place. And there is nothing that holds the cartridge case to the bolt face. Ah, OK. Wow, that's. Uh... Crazy, huh? Yeah, like I, I can see like there's a small, like small, like little moon shape that actually holds like where it's supposed to seat. Like the yes. should yeah, that's, where, that's where it's supposed to seat but normally you'd have your extractor on this side yeah which which again in a 22 the purpose of the extractor is to ensure that the case stays on the bolt face right yeah so so in the event that it's a lighter powered cartridge because it's attached to the bolt face assuming the cartridge can defeat the recoil spring it's going to eject are you with me? Yeah. But in this case, if the cartridge isn't strong enough, it doesn't work. Now your firing pin sits here. So you can see where the firing pin comes through the Okay. The breech face. Yeah. Okay, now I see how it yeah. Okay. Now you have this metal plate. And on this metal plate, you have your bolt guide rod. Okay. And so this metal plate um, also holds your barrel. Okay. Notice there is no ramp whatsoever. Yeah, that's it is something that's actually unusual. Like. I'm wondering, like, how do you, how does it feed? Like, so barrel goes in here, 
Uh, guide rod goes in there, and this is the system. Okay. Wow. Um. So fully closed, that's what it looks like. Wow. Ish. <laughs> you know, I mean, everything's straighter. Yeah. Wow. That's... Holy crap. So, again, if, you know, if it picks a cartridge up out of the magazine, right, and feeds yeah. it in, and it goes bang, and there's not enough energy. Okay. There's, yeah, it's because the ejector should be doing like it this ejector it's stationary the, the extractor yeah the extractor should be pulling it out right yeah it looks like almost like it's like somewhat magnetized a little bit like well um so right now we have gravity on our side yeah okay so gravity is pushing the case against the polymer which is allowing it to to pull out right okay. but if i if i turn it up you know it doesn't as much okay pretty insane huh that is yeah that's a, that is such a weird concept I mean, but it's 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 interesting and it's cool. Um, it's it practical. That's kind of like another thing too. Uh, if it works, it's practical. If it doesn't work, it's not practical. It doesn't work. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's not practical. Uh, what company? What company decided to come up with this idea? Well, it was made by U.S. Firearms, um, and uh, I mean they had all sorts of craziness like. Um, they had it. They had a setup where uh, you could actually put a Picatinny rail here or attachment, and then mount it on your underneath your AR. Oh, oh snap! Okay, which I got some ATF questions about. I mean, it's a pistol. But if I attach it to the AR, because the AR has a stock, have I now turned this into a short barrel rifle, or not? I would have just, I would have, I would have seen it as like just uh, either like a foregrip or vertical grip. How do you want to see it? That just happens to go know. pew pew. That's because I mean it's I mean it would be I mean in some. In some way like it'd be the same thing if you if you actually you know put an attachment to your air of like either like a, a pump action shotgun or a 203 like right but if you but uh so if it's a 203 you're not most of us can't afford a 40 millimeter so we buy the 37 millimeter which is considered a flare device under u.s coast guard standards and so it is it it would be separate because you're not actually firing munitions you're firing flares okay um, um, on the shotgun um as long as the barrel on the shotgun is at least 18 inches you're fine once you shorten it now it becomes an nfa item because the barrel of a shotgun can't be any less than you know 18 and a 18 inches Oh my gosh. Okay. This is wow. Wow. So can you put a shotgun underneath your AR? Yes. Can you legally do it without a tax stamp? Yes. But the barrel has to be no less than 18 inches. Wow. This is up. This is that. This is getting, like, it is getting very out of hand. A little bit it's getting a little it's just getting out of hand with it now the way that <laughs> the the nit I guess that the nitpicking of it is just kind of yeah 
Okay. Yeah. So question is, is how do we try and make this thing work? Right. Um, you know, obviously the, the, we don't have an extractor, so we could, we could on the bolt, uh, we could come in and we could cut here, right. And cut back and install an extractor. Um, yeah. You know, drill with a spring and then, you know, pin it from below. Um, yeah. You know, you know, if you're going to do that, you're better off running the pin all the way through that way. So it'd be a long pin, but that way you can get it back out. Right now you could, you could thread it. Um, but then, you know, what size uh, screw are you going to go with or what size cap head Allen screw you're going to use? So a pin would be easier. Yeah. Yeah, because you're gonna need to. Because you're gonna need to. Because it can't. Like, there's no other way to get it out if it, if it's only just one. Right, right. If it's only partly partly way in, you'll never get it back out again. You know. Then the question is, okay, so I cut my slot. How you know? How am, am I going to make the extractor, or am I going to try and find an extractor that currently exists for another twenty-two? If I if I do that you know, that's going to determine how far back it is. Well, I have to put a spring plunger on there because I need a spring to be able to hold the extractor against the rim, right? Yeah. So now we're looking at, uh, we're looking at what our cutout is plus where we're drilling to then put the spring in, you know, that we then push the extractor into place and then we drive our pin through. Yeah. Uh, so assuming we didn't want to do all of that, Right. Okay. The only next thing that we can do is actually work on polishing the chamber. Yeah, that's actually true. Okay. Now, um, you, do you have a Dremel or a Fordham or um, a Roto tool of any sort? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, when you buy them, uh, it comes with all these different attachments or, you know, tools i guess yeah and i haven't even haven't even gotten close to using any of them so uh, what i did in preparation for our time earlier i took this uh 60 grit sandpaper <laughs> and i took <laughs> i took one of the felt wheels yeah i put it on here and then i ran it against the 60 grit <laughs> until it was a tight fit inside the chamber. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, that's one way. Put your polishing compound on here, zzz, 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 polish it out. Uh, okay. Because because the the head spacing on this is on the rim, you're not, uh, as long as I don't mess with that cutout, I'm not necessarily worried about going a little bit too deep into the barrel itself okay because there's a throat in there anyway right yeah so, so that that's fine okay and to give you an idea you know really that's that's how roughly how deep you're going okay okay now if you if you're really concerned about how deep you're gonna get um where did i put my here it is one of the things you can do, blue painter's tape is a savior, right? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm right there. So now I'm going to take this. Ah, uh, okay. And now I know how deep I need to go. Okay. And you don't need that. I mean, you can obviously go with a, a smaller piece of painter's tape. I just grabbed what I had. Okay. All right. So that's that's one way. So polishing compound, and then you'd want to um, you'd want to do another one um, that 
doesn't have any polishing compound on it so that um, uh, so you can clean it out because you you want to clean out that that polishing compound yeah now another option and we talked about these in one of the classes was Kratex. Yeah. So Kratex is um, uh, abrasive infused rubber. Yeah. And you buy it in a kit and it comes with different grits and it tells you what your grits are up, up top right yeah so dark green is coarse medium green brown uh fine texture is red and then uh you know extra fine is green so you would you would start with this one and just work your way through them to get that um, mirror mirror polish you know what those look i think what i think the dremel that i bought has something that's close to that it, it looks like kind of like a rubber wheel a little bit i thought it was i thought it was some type of uh rubber washer or some something like that yeah take a look at it 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 may be the same kratex was it, you can see it's c-r-a-t-e-x um kratex was specifically developed for you know machining and and uh i would I use a lot of the Dremel tools, but I don't necessarily use them on guns. <laughs> um, I haven't done that yet either. Like I haven't, not yet. Yeah, because I think this, I think it might be. Yeah, that kind of looks like something that's like kind of like. Yeah. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, um, it's got a little bit. It's got a little bit of just like a little bit of like give. And and you, you can buy, I mean, they're just straight up rubber polishing discs. So they don't necessarily have any um, any abrasive in them. Just the rubber itself will polish. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, there's there's any all this says there's any number of options. Now, um, because you know they come in all these different sizes and shapes and diameters, um, you know to to get one that because I mean I could use this one right, but it's only going to go so far in, and then I begin to impact the rim cutout. Yeah. It looks kind of yeah. It looks a little bit tapered. So um, let's see. Now you would because like, even just even just trying to modify that that bit. I don't know. So what I did, same thing, sixty grit sandpaper, and I ran it against the sixty grit <laughs> <laughs> until I got it to the right diameter. And it oh okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Now, I would like it just a tad tighter than that, but that that's another way that you can take this instead of using polishing compound and everything else. You know, I you could use a Kratex because with Kratex you don't use any oil. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, because like I think what they get I. I wasn't even trying. I was trying to figure out what they, what this even brought, what they even sent me to, like whatever came with that. And I was like, is this what I'm thinking? Everyone's been talking about, like the polishing comp compound. It's like, yep, that's it. Huh. Okay. Um. In fact, I need to. And uh, I'm actually probably going to use this instead. All right, so uh, lapping compound, right? You buy it by grit, all right? So this is uh, 
600 grit, 800 grit, 1000 grit, 1200 grit, whatever. Um, it is a uh, nasty. Wow. Yeah, that looks like clay or just mud. Yeah, it's, it's a greasy mess. Okay. Now, the idea is, is that like it when if you go with 1911 builder and you build your own 1911, right? Yeah. If you do that, you're going to use lapping compound to match the slide to the frame. So, you know, the rails you cut, you slather with this, you slather it on the inside of the, the ways on the slide. And then literally it's a work back and forth because the action itself is then polishing itself it it's taking away exactly what it needs for for it to be mirror smooth and matched ah okay that's okay. actually a pretty good idea um so the the thing is is that um you know the 1911s that come off the line you know they buy them or they they cut them and they, they use all the same cutter or, you know, you know, so just cut, 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 cut. Well, the reason that sometimes you get a little bit of rattle is because the slide isn't mated specifically to that frame, right? So um, the 2011 that I, that I am building, um, every slide has been hand fit to the frame. So they match each other perfectly. Um, that's that's where the the extra dollars come when you're talking about buying a custom firearm. Is is that is that the pieces are hand fit? So you just don't go and buy your your trigger and sear and hammer and hammer strut. Um, you buy them, but then you make sure that the sides are polished to meet the sides of the frame and the sides of the frame are polished so that you remove any drag yeah. so um that's that's truly when, when like if you buy a, a wilson combat or a kimber or a nighthawk custom uh, that's what's going on that's why they cost so much is the time to make sure that all the pieces match yeah okay cool Now, I'm actually going to use the lapping compound instead of a polishing compound. Um, I like uh, the way the lapping compound works. Um, I don't know if your Dremel has a light on it, but boy, how do I tell you? I really like having the light. No, it does not. And that's already, and that look like, I need one like that. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to get this positioned as best we can because it's tight, right? And then... Okay. Like I said, it's an abrasive grease, so nasty. Yeah, that looks, yeah. Well, no, let's see if we can actually get a light in there so you can see. Tell you what, the angles are hard. Okay. Yeah. And you can see how much of that came off because it looked like. Yeah, that is. Dang.
Now, we know we got that compound in there, so we're going to take a clean one. And same deal. Oh, okay. All right. So since we didn't go very deep, right? We just we we only went to here. Yeah. Um you know, I just wanted to make sure that you know we got that in there and ran that. Now, an option that we have at this point is do we want to do a slight ramp? right um in this case i'm just using the paper towel to try and get anything that might have extended into the barrel itself nope we're good all right so super smooth on the okay. right yeah now, um, the way the barrel sits in here is you have a flat and a flat. Oh, sorry. All right, so you have it. You have two flats on this yeah. bottom one. Well, those correspond with the flats here and here, so it doesn't matter. But uh, there's not necessarily a, uh, you know, get it in and then it, it slides down, right? So if we wanted to do a slight ramp, hmm. we would want to do it on the bottom edge. Yeah. Okay. And we don't need much. Because remember that, um, remember that uh, twelve gauge shotgun where they took too much. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't need much, right? But what we're gonna need is we want to just touch it right here. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, okay. So. A slight ramp. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I mean it's 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 very slight. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to give the nose something to hit. So instead of it being here, where it might catch on that our our rim, right? Yeah. You know, just give it enough that if it's a little bit low, it, that old give because see that's the the mel plant and old give are what deal with how it rotates into the chamber. Yeah. Okay. Got lapping compound on my computer screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So obviously we used, you know, an abrasive uh, sanding disc for that. So now we want to uh, polish that out. So that it's not rough. Oh, 
Okay, so Craytex. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So see the difference? Yep. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't necessarily want to do that on maybe a nine millimeter, right? But again, with the 22, I'm not impacting, not impacting where the gas seal is, which is up here, right? Yeah. So um, and I didn't come far enough back into the chamber uh, to cause um, really much of an unsupported case head. Yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. Look, yeah, just 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 enough to just, just, a, just a touch. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna come over here a little bit and add a little bit more. Um, make sure that it's even. See if it'll focus. All right. See, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. So that gives us a nice ramp from here to here. So no matter what angle they're coming, they should be able to go in without any issue. Okay. Now, having done that, we got some grit back in the uh, in the chamber. So we're going to go back to um, that uh, cotton piece. Hi. Just to make sure we get everything out. All right. So with that done, next step is to put this thing back together. All right, so we have this piece and we have this piece, right? So these two actually go in here. And I may... Yeah, that's right. It's one of those cases where you kind of got to hold everything just right <laughs> for it to. It, it yeah, it looks like it looks like the whole the whole frame is just two side plates. It is. It is, and you know, I mean, you could. I could take it more apart than this, but I decided not to. I can only imagine how field stripping that thing is. Like it's gonna be like 
distance. Like it would be like it would be be a while. Yeah, I I wouldn't want to do it in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. All right, so once you get the plate where the plate goes, then, or at least in, then you got to get your rod, because it's like guide rod for the whole contraption in place. And once you get that in, three point bind. There we are. Okay. So, <sighs> All right, <laughs> so metal plates in, right? Okay. Guide rod is where it's supposed to be. Now, um, before it didn't matter which way was up on this because we didn't have the ramp, right? So now we want to make sure that the ramp is down. And so it pulls through. here okay all right so look in there you see barrel guide rod this part of the ejection plate you know that plate sits there okay okay yeah now i like uh have you ever used frog lube no i have not Okay, so frog lube is environmentally friendly, has a very pleasant, uh, minty smell to it, um, and as a paste, uh, I like it especially on um, parts that I'm not going to be getting into very much. Yeah. Right, because I can get it in the threads, I'm not worried about it, and you notice it really melts just by body heat. So yeah, it does. Super easy to work with. Um, okay. So now that we have the barrel in, we need to make sure the barrel stays in. So this is the barrel shroud. Ah, uh, okay. All right. And it screws on. And it came with a nifty uh, wrench that is located here. Oh, okay. So, um, I won't say it's necessarily easy to use, but... <laughs> does at least allow better purchase than just your fingers. Okay, so barrels in place, plates in place, guide rods in place. Next is our bolt. So the bolt comes in on that uh, guide rod. Assuming it doesn't want to be ornery. Oh, 
it's a good thing this company didn't actually win a contract with the military. <laughs> All right, so bolts in place. So if we look at it from this side, you can see where the bolt sits against the barrel. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, you have these two paddle looking things. This is how you charge it <laughs> and cock it. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, uh, these two pieces. Uh, These two pieces actually go in those cutouts on the front. See them? Okay. You've got that one. So you push it in and then notice how it's pushing back on the on the bolt. Yeah. One hex screw goes in. And then the second one goes in. Wonder if that would. Act, I wonder if this this firearm actually is considered like personal defense weapon. Uh, I wouldn't use it for that. <laughs> I mean, I can only imagine like the way that they're like, let's just make something compact that can be stowed away. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, the the idea was really good. Uh, execution, not so much. Yeah. It, it just has like all these different like designs of like several types of firearms just in one. So load. Give it a little bit more space. Okay. Now firing pin goes in next. So the firing pin comes in and you have to you have to turn it slightly so that it, it comes up and then again it's gonna ride on that same rod. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Then comes the recoil spring. Now, the recoil spring sits here. Okay. And this little piece of plastic clips on here. Oh, okay. On that ledge. So, what we have to do, what we have here is failure to communicate. I'm not a smart man. 
Uh, now, if you look at the front of this, I don't know that you can see it. See that cut out right here? It's kind of pointed. So the end of the recoil rod is pointed. So the recoil rod is going to come in to that groove. And then this piece, at least it should catch right there. Maybe. Okay. Assuming everything works exactly the way it's supposed to. Because there's never any issues ever. Ever. Do, 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 do. Come on, bugger boo. A lot of three point binds. Yeah, everything is just so, it, everything is just micro. Yes. Now, so here to here. Okay. Check that just to be sure. Yeah, uh, it didn't help very much. Um, I don't know. There, can you see that hole? Yeah. That's where the pointy end of the firing pin goes, or the recoil rod. Oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> So like everything else, <laughs> we have to collapse this down. Um, <clears throat> get you some smooth jaw pliers. Yeah. See how there's yeah. no, that way you don't bugger anything up. But trying to hold the pressure on the rod and compress a spring and hold the, <laughs> the locking device is not easy. No, it's not. They should have. They should have made some type of tool, I guess, or some something. Yeah, cause that is not all right. So <sighs> almost there. <laughs> oh wow! Okay. So we need to move this over because we want it in that that groove. And then, there you go. Wow, yeah. Wow, what is the poundage for that trigger? Um, I don't know. I don't have my meter here. It's actually down south. Uh, but I will check it. All right, so then this is your end plate. So catch on the bottom. 
and push it in place. And now your top plate. Okay. So top plate slides in and then it latches right there. So you pull up. And there you go. And that top plate also is like your sights. Rear, rear sights. Okay. Dang. And front sight. Wow. Now, unfortunately, uh, it's night, so I'm not going to go in my backyard and shoot, although I could. Um, so with a dummy round. Oh, it takes a rotator, ro ro rotating one. Okay. Okay. So 1022 magazine locked in place. Then it would be charge. You can see, yeah, and then again, remember the issue is it straight blowback? So, yeah. not that extractor. Hmm. So, the only way to check and see if we fixed it would now be to test fire it. Yeah, we got to make sure that the chamber's polished enough. Obviously, the ramp worked fine for the loading, right? Yeah, and um, you know, I'm able to pull it back and it just falls out. So I feel pretty comfortable that we've we've probably fixed it. But there you go. Wow. Yeah, like wow, how far like I can see the like the bolt, like how how far back does the bolt go all the way? It opens the breach like completely. Yeah, bolt goes all the way back to here. And there's no way to actually put anything to actually as an extractor. Well, you'd have to put it on the bolt. Yeah. So in addition, in addition to doing your cutout on your on your bolt, you'd have to do an indent or a recess on uh, the side of the chamber. Yeah. Yeah, there's just not enough. There's like no space for you to make any to actually attach anything or. No. So. There's your. Primary hand, there's your secondary hand, and there's how you would engage. Wow. That is something, too. And I was kind of hoping, like, the magazine would be at least, like, somewhat acting like a pistol, like a grip for it, at least. Well, you could put a 25-round magazine in it. Oh, or, okay. All right. Or you could go with... Um, See what I have over here. Oh, let's unload this one. So here's a here's a straight ten round instead of uh okay. But even then, yeah. even then, that wouldn't necessarily work. It, I mean, I guess it gives you something. No, yeah, the way that it, the way that curves now, it just, yeah. All right. So I'll stop sharing. Okay. So there, uh, there you have it. Oh wow, that's actually pretty cool. <laughs> when did that? When did that company actually just belly up? Like when did they stop? Oh, uh, to 2013, somewhere around there. Okay. Yeah, because now it's like I. Shoot, if I could find one, that'd be fun. That'd be actually something to actually try to change. Oh yeah, um, I, you know, I'd look on Gunbroker, um, you know, and and, and check them and, and and see, 
you know, I, I, heck, you might even be able to find them at a pawn shop. <laughs> That's uh, actually true. Yeah. Yeah, you because know, I'm sure there's plenty of people who are like, what a hunk of junk. I'm going to get rid of this sucker. So, <laughs> but anyway, all right. Well, Trey, I'm glad you I'm glad you joined and I'm glad we got to to do that. Um I hope that I hope that all of that has helped with blowback firearms and and making that clear. Yeah, it does. It I I appreciate it a lot too, because like when you it's like when trying to see some of the animations that some some like they actually produce like for some videos, the not much of like do like the justice of it is like not really there. It's like there's still more of like the animation or it's like the animation is either too uh it's not it's not like it's not slowing down a little bit. It's kind yeah, of like what what I found a lot of times is that those animations are great if you have a narrative that goes with it that explains what you're seeing. Yeah. And but there is one actually the only one I found that actually was really that actually worked out really good was it was on it's on YouTube, but it's actually it actually was done in uh the late fifties, early early sixties. It's still it's still in black and white. And <laughs> and it shows like a, it has like a, there's a guy and it's got it's this long diagram of like showing what the gas like what a gas blowback would do like how it actually functions to do it. And they have the ones with the short, like short stroke and then the long stroke too, with, with an actual, like, uh, like the pivot, the, the, was it spring that's inside the, uh, the gas piston that actually does. And it was like, that actually made sense. I saw that and I was like, now I actually see how that functions, how that act, what they mean by that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that, and that's one of the reasons why I really like doing these with you guys um because i i think it gives you an opportunity to ask questions to see what's going on um yeah and and, and getting to see the parts i think helps a lot it it does too it's like yeah like reading from the textbooks like it some of the stuff does seem a little bit like repetitive too because it's the same words over and over and then but explaining like the cycles of it too it's Sometimes it gets like, wait a minute, I had to, wait a minute, I had to read back again to actually, because I think I skipped, like, you know, I skipped the line. Yep. Um, I am going to stop the recording.